So hi everyone, I'm Beth Rebay and I'm the Director of Repair and the host of the Civics Project. And I'm joined today with my special co-host, co Naomi Cross, who's also my wonderful 13-year-old goddaughter. Wonderful, Naomi. It's so good to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. So we're going to start with a brief uh, land acknowledgement. Repair acknowledges the Gabrielina Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarahatum, the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to Hanukvatam, the ancestors, Ahihiram, the elders, and Iohinkem, our relatives and relations past, present, and emerging. And Naomi is joining us from New Jersey and she's on uh, traditional Lenape territory. <coughs> so our subject matter today for episode 41 focuses on the Transportation Security Administration, which we generally all know as TSA. And uh, the Transportation Security Admission, Administration, excuse me, essentially has the, admission, the mission of uh, being responsible for keeping transportation pathways and the airway in particular uh, clear so that people have the freedom to move safely. So that's their overarching mission. I wanted to ask Naomi if you could tell us when and how the TSA was first created. Of course. So it started on November 19th, 2001. Uh, it was created by the Aviation and Transportation Security Act two months after 9-11, and it's part of the Homeland Security. So that part of the Homeland Security Division of the U.S. government? <coughs> yes, and you're right. The Congress created it on November 19th in 2001. Do you remember the name of the act that created it? Do you know the that? Aviation Act? Yeah. Uh, the Aviation and Transportation Act, Security Act. Yes, Aviation and Transportation Security Act. So two months after September 11th, Congress passed this act and it created the TSA. And as Naomi noted, it was then housed as part of Homeland Security. So what kind of budget do they have to do this, uh, to do all their work keeping airports safe? So the TSA, uh, the TSA has like an allocated budget of $6.5 billion coming through Congress and 2.1 from fees such as the 9-11 fee. And interestingly enough, they found that in 2019, the TSA had made $900,000 off the coins of the floor of the security lines. Okay. So I, I have a question for you. What's an example of the way TSA has developed in response to specific security threats? Sure. Um, so the TSA itself, obviously, is, as you noted, as we were when we were preparing Naomi, is uh, specifically a response to the terrorist acts of, nine, of 2011. Um, but they have continued to develop new practices and regulations uh, in order to in order to respond to specific threats. So one example we know now that we live with is that when you want to fly you uh, are not allowed to bring a lot of liquids on, into the plane and you have to have, if you have them, they have to be like very small quantities and sealed in bags. And this practice was developed in response to basically a, a foiled terrorist plot. It was foiled by the British police and they had planned, the terrorists had planned to put liquid explosives on 10 transatlantic flights, which were going from the United Kingdom to the United States or to Canada. And so the result of this uh, terrorist plot, which again was prevented, so thankfully those planes did not explode midair, resulted in a ban on liquids and gels and aerosols. And because intelligence in the time was, re was recording an ongoing you know, threat or concern about future threats, they also added the requirement that people would have to remove their shoes in 2006. Now you might have heard earlier than that in December of 2001 that the so-called shoe bomber, a man named Richard Reed, who brought explosives onto a plane in the soles of his shoes and then attempted 
to light them on fire, but was stopped by some of his fellow passengers and the flight attendants. So one of the, so the shoe removal was not an immediate response to his actual attempt to smuggle explosives in his shoes, but after the attempt to set off liquid explosives, TSA decided to step up requirements overall. So that's why it's hard for us to carry anything liquid onto planes and why we have to take off our shoes at security. Does that answer the question, Naomi? Yes. Okay, so good. I've heard something about TSA using robots. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. Uh, so I think when folks hear about that, they have a picture of sort of like physical robots that are humanoid in appearance. And I don't know of any of those uh, in US airports, but uh, robotic technologies are used through TSA for something called credential authentication technologies or CATS. So CATS are basically robotic machines that uh, people can interact with to have their ID scanned, their boarding pass verified without having human interaction or direct touch. And they're actually in place now. More than 100 US airports are using some cats. And uh, Los Angeles International Airport, or LAX, just as of January this year, began became the first airport to go uh, fully cat. So that doesn't mean you don't see human beings at, T at TSA, because they're still working on patting people down and getting them through security at the checkpoints but it does mean that it's possible at TSA to have all of your identification solely checked by machines. So Naomi, I wanted to ask you a question. You were telling me that when you were preparing for today, you found an article in Vox and started reading more about transgender people facing discrimination from TSA. Want to tell us a little about that? Of course. So in 2015, uh, there was a trans woman by the name of Shady uh, uh, Potasai, and she was held in an Orlando TSA because uh, of what they had called an anomaly, mainly because her genitalia did not match their expectation. And so that was really disturbing thing to hear, and I was really disappointed in that. So I have a question for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about racial profiling in TSA? I can, but I want to add a little more to what you said about the transgender case of Shady Podolsky. Um, one of the things that the National Center for Transgender Law has reported to us is that these are common practices, that transgender people are facing a number of challenges from TSA because agents will see, um, will see transgender bodies as a security threat for whatever reason, um, generally transphobia, but the notion is like if somebody's genitalia doesn't match what the TSA agent thinks they look like. They assume that that person is in disguise or a suspected terrorist. And so this sort of basic lack of comprehension of trans people is then prompting heightened security and more invasive pat downs. And one of the consequences of that is that some trans people will also end up outed, uh, you know, who don't want to be uh, by TSA agents in the airport. So definitely an ongoing area of concern. And you'd asked me about racial profiling and we have similar sets of dynamics where TSA agent biases can significantly disadvantage travelers who are people of color. Now the TSA claims they have a formal policy indicating that they should not choose passengers based on race and ethnicity, but of course we know it's still happening. And in, in general, we're seeing more than a thousand civil liberties complaints each year, most of them addressing questions of racial profiling. So the US government has something called the General Accountability Office or the GAO, which is responsible essentially for monitoring government entities. And the GAO has basically said the TSA needs to work on this. They have to develop additional oversight guidelines for preventing unlawful profiling and they uh, need to basically train their agents more robustly not to profile based on race. One of the challenges is that TA guidelines do indicate that they can refer passengers for additional screening if they exhibit fear, stress, or deception. And that's such a subjective and, and problematic requirement 
Like, so, you know, one of the things that indicates is that somebody who's afraid of flying would be more likely to be aggressively searched. But also when you've got a dynamic in which it's become common knowledge that uh, some populations of color and particularly Muslim people or people who are mistaken for Muslims are likely to be profiled in airports, people will just demonstrate stress. So ironically, it then gives this, you know, the TA, TSA an excuse to profile them. There was a case at Newark Airport, uh, which resulted in a lawsuit against the Transportation Security Administration after 14 different Muslim women were targeted in the same, in the same time period uh, by a TSA agent who pulled them over for wearing hijabs, headscarves. Uh, and use something the agent referred to as a 2110, which is allegedly, TSA has not confirmed this, a code for Muslim women wearing hijabs. So 14 women, not all of whom knew each other, some were family members, have sued TSA for profiling at Newark Airport, requesting damages, apologies, and that their agents should go through mandatory diversity training. And so this is one example, and there's also a small scholarly literature that's developed to kind of track the ways in which racial profiling plays out through TSA. Does that answer the question, Naomi? Yes, it does. Okay, good. So I have another question for you. So TSA has also posed challenges <coughs> for survivors of violence, pregnant women, and people with disabilities. So what are some of the challenges uh, at hand? Absolutely. So the screening guideline I mentioned that people who are fearful, stressed, or appear to be deceptive, which is one of the ways that transgender people are maltreated sometimes by TSA agents who see their bodies or their genders as deceptive. This also creates a particular and disparate impact for people with psychiatric disabilities. So people who manifest or show more fear, more stress, because they are living with mental illnesses that cause fear and stress, are then more likely to be targeted for additional and invasive screening. And those experiences can be traumatic or frightening enough to somebody who's already dealing with a high level of anxiety that that may deter somebody for flying, from flying. So again, one challenge is that the requirements, you know, basically create extra risks for people who are dealing with psychiatric disabilities and mental illnesses. And then for people with physical disabilities, there are a set of challenges as well. Um, one comes up just around how does the TSA handle wheelchairs or walkers and relate to people who uh, are not able to walk through uh, screening equipment. And what we see is we've had examples of people's equipment being broken, um, presumably and intentionally, but that doesn't help the passenger by TSA agents. And also that people who cannot walk or are not able to walk safely through a scanner are subjected to much more aggressive searches and pat downs. Um, in addition, TSA seems to have very inconsistent approaches to how to screen, screen physical devices themselves when they are too large to pass through the automated scanning equipment. So for instance, how to scan a wheelchair um, and that can pose a significant set of challenges as well. And there are solutions which could keep us all safe, but not create a disparate burden for people with disabilities. One which is to develop scanning equipment, which was attuned to a passenger being able to get through it in a wheelchair. Uh, and most scanners are not physically constructed to make that possible. A third uh, category you mentioned was pregnant women. And one of the things that keeps coming up is that the scanners and imagers that are available in airports and that TSA uses uh, raise some questions for pregnant women about safety, how to pass through when you're pregnant. Is there any danger to your fetus of doing so? And the general consensus is that it's probably safe, but it's still an issue that what pregnant women discuss with doctors and that some don't feel comfortable with. T TSA's formal policy is that if a pregnant woman does not want to walk through a scanner, they're supposed to agree to that and to pat it down. But what we've had reported is that often TSA agents start arguing and start telling women they're being ridiculous or unreasonable and that the, the scanners are perfectly safe despite their own policies. So one of the challenges that we see is that this can 
create significant delay, more pressure on pregnant women who are trying to minimize stress. And then you also mentioned survivors of violence, Naomi. And one of the things that we know is that uh, whether it's a full body pat down or a targeted pat down of part of the body, uh, new TSA screening procedures in the last 15 years have dramatically increased the ways in which TSA puts hands on and interacts directly with people's bodies. And for survivors of sexual or physical assaults, this can be really traumatic. Uh, particularly keep in mind, you know, what it's like for a rape survivor to have a TSA agent insisting on patting down her or his or their crotch uh, before allowing them to continue air travel. So invasive pat downs for some survivors of violence have resulted in people not flying. I knew a survivor who, when the new security regulations were put in place, uh, she was you know, likely being targeted because of her race and also just really uncomfortable with aggressive pat downs. And so she just stopped flying and she uh, started taking Amtrak even when she had to get from California to New York. Um, and so that again, sort of raises some broader civil liberties questions because being able to be mobile to go places is part of how we've understood freedom under the constitution. But I have a last question for you, Naomi, which is with all this security, with all these heightened recommendations and all the burdens it creates for people of color, transgender people, women who are pregnant, women and, and men and boys and girls who are survivors of violence and for people with disabilities, is all this security catching any terrorists and ensuring that our airways are safe? Well, the fact is TSA security poses little to no help to prevent attacks. Um, as a 2016 experiment from Homeland Security Team Red provided, about 17 out of 18 times, they were unable to um, catch weapons, bombs, or drugs uh, that the undercover people were trying to sneak in. And it was super ineffective, and it really came to show how easy it is to sneak stuff through TSA. Okay. So yeah, and it would be hard to know. I don't think I would go quite so far as to say it, it poses no help. It might be worse without it. But what we know is that we're not safe and we're not necessarily safer than we were before the, the passage of the Aviation and Transportation Security Act. So at least according to the government entity which houses it, TSA has been failing uh, to minimize to the degree we would want the risk of a terrorist threat, but at the same time, its practices have, and in some instances, its formal policies have uh, increased the burden on the civil liberties of people who are traveling. So for people who wanna learn more, Naomi, do you have a book recommendation for today? Yes, I do. So the book is Profiles in Injustice, Why Racial Profiling Cannot Work. And this is by David A. Harris. Wonderful. You can buy it on Amazon. Paperbacks are $16.95. <laughs> Thank you for the cost information, Naomi. So we have one more Civics Project episode coming up next week, episode 42, the last of the year, and we're actually going to be going on hiatus for a while. So next week is your last chance to catch a Civics Project episode uh, until we come back, likely later in 2022. And Naomi was very adamant about what our last episode in this immediate series should be. So what's our topic for next week, which is December 19th? Abortion rights. Okay. So I hope some of you will come back for episode 42 on Sunday, December 19th at two o'clock Pacific, five o'clock Eastern time. I'm delighted to have uh, Naomi co-host this, this last episode with me and hope a lot of you will join us then. Alrighty, so we're going to end our recording. I want to thank our podcast listening audience for joining us for this episode and for your support of the Civics Project. And Zoom audience will have a little time for Q&A and conversation uh, once the recording ends.